What up, big kids, and what up, uh, Sad Toy Expo? I am your moderator, Sean Long. Uh, you might know me from YouTube, but um, if you don't know this guy, then where have you been the last, like, what, 40 years now? It's like you've been in the business like, almost 40 years now? I lost track somewhere somewhere way back, but... Uh, but how can that be? You're, you're past, like present, past, present, and presumably future. <laughs> yes. Like, he, like, never ages. He's still 21, like, ever since he's been, he's been in the business. I, uh, I haven't decided what I want to be when I grow up, so... Well, I want to be you when I grow up, Greg. <laughs> but anyway, I have to introduce you guys. Um, what, a, a voice actor near and dear to my heart. You might know him from G.I. Joe. You might know him from Spider-Man. You might know him from Garfield and Friends as Odie, which is one of your big characters. But one character, a few characters you've done that is near and dear to your heart, from the original Transformers show from the 80s, Grimlock, Skyfire, Long Haul, just to name a few. We got Greg Berger here, round of applause. Hi guys, and hi room, and hi Sacramento. Very happy to be here. So, um, uh, Greg, to start out, like, let's um, talk about how you got into this. You've been doing this now for like 30, like seven years now, or something? Uh, you would know better than me. I go to I go to IMDb.com to find out what I've done, what I'm doing, and what I'm going to be doing. Um, but I, I started out uh, as an actor, and I'm still an actor, and I'm allowed to do what it is that I love doing, and I've been allowed to uh, make a, a very nice career of it. But uh, I started doing theater in college. Uh, theater led to more theater, led to more theater, led to more theater. Uh, it brought me to Los Angeles. I did a lot of on-camera work and pilots for CBS. And somewhere along the line, and always along the line, I used to voice motivate characters that I did. Uh, I'm still of the opinion that they don't cast voices, they cast characters. It's all character work. Um, and I stumbled into some opportunities. I was seen on stage uh, by Gordon Hunt, who at that time was doing the voice direction for Hanna-Barbera. He had asked to say hello to me afterwards. It was a play that I was jumping in and out of character in. He said, if you're as versatile as what we saw on stage, we should know about you for animation. I said, well, you've had my demo for uh, quite some time now, if you can move it from the bottom of the pile to the top of the pile. So that actually was a moment of opportunity which changed every day of the rest of my life. Uh, and I'm a terminal optimist, it'll kill me someday, but I'll die with a smile on my face. And uh, I believe that opportunities happen for everyone. And if you mistake it for just another moment, then that's what it becomes. And if you don't, and recognize it for the opportunity that it is, and seize it, uh, I'm here to tell you it can change your life. Exactly. Now, let's let's talk about Transformers for a moment, because I know that's one, one of your big roles. Uh, well, you did a few roles. Me Dinobot leader! Woo! <laughs> Slag and sludge do what Grimlock say. Big muscle, small brain. <laughs> No, I was gonna ask. Uh, I know you told uh, the story a few times, like at bot cons and everything. But uh, creating the voice of Grimlock, because um, you're like a really like soft-spoken guy. Like hearing, like you would not think that you're Grimlock just hearing your normal voice. Like what made you? Because like Skyfire is more your normal voice, but Grimlock, what, what, where did you? What made you go down and deep in your soul? To I, find I think voice? all voice casting is kind of a dilemma that is shared by the writer, the artist, uh, the director, and the voice talent. And uh, there were descriptions of how huge Grimlock's jaw was, and that he was moving basically like that, and also the, the that he was motivated by muscle more than uh, brain, or at least the way it was depicted. And uh, so you you get all of the elements, and you become the detective, and you stir them around, and uh, you. At some point in any audition process for voiceover work, you want to be prepared, but not too prepared because there'll be fine tuning, there'll be suggestions based upon what they hear, but you also want to make a point, or I feel it necessary to make a point in a, a voice audition of, of uh, trying to surprise myself as well as them. You want to be prepared, but also be spontaneous. And so uh, it was kind of a, a wonderful mix of both. There was a concern 
when I got the part. Of whether or not I could sustain, Wally Burr said, are you going to be able to sustain this voice? And I said, well, I, I darn well better because I, I uh, given given the opportunity, I'm going to I'm going to make this work for as long as it's possible for it to work. Well, no one had any idea of the longevity of the series, the adaptability of the franchise, the uh, first and foremost and endmost uh, fandom that would arise out of it, the demands that would be made by fandom, the loyalty that would be expressed by fandom, and and uh, here we are, and it's still it's still present tense. I I. Uh, I last appeared in, in Transformers Fall of Cybertron. Uh, and it's a, it's a deeper, darker, more cinematic uh, depiction of Grimlock. Uh, but, uh, but there I was. And it's, it's just... I'm humbled by it and overwhelmed by it and so proud of it, uh, along with most of the, all of the work that I do. Yeah, I was actually going to ask about uh, Fall of Cybertron since it was the first time voicing Grimlock in many years for you because I know you've seen Grimlock and Transformers Emmy and David K. which I remember at BotCon when you guys did your Grimlock all oh, that was amazing. I wish you guys were at that BotCon. But um, yeah, like how was it uh, getting that call from High Moon like to voice Grimlock? You were the first OG Grimlock, so how did it feel to come back to it? It was, I mean, it's spectacular aside from the fact that it's flattering beyond belief. It's an opportunity to uh, reintroduce the audience as well as as well as ourselves to uh, a, a a kind of a different incarnation uh, version of a, an already existing character. So anytime you can add new elements to a recipe that you already have, uh, I, I I put my heart and soul into it, and I I, I really. It meant everything to me because I know so much more about the world of Transformers and Transformer fans and Transformer audience than any of us could have known back then. You can't, you can't anticipate the longevity of anything because there's, there's an X factor that goes with any creative undertaking uh, that involves an audience. There are fantastic uh, properties that get overlooked because an audience never embraces them. There are probably less fantastic properties that do get embraced for reasons that nobody really understands. But if you resonate with an audience, if something you do makes sense to an audience and the audience not only embraces it but holds it tight and holds it tight for decades, you know, that, that, that's, uh, that's something historic and, and noteworthy. And um, the Transformers world and franchise has almost ceased to, this is hard to explain, but it's almost become so real that it, it exists as kind of an alternate reality. People have, have made it part of their lives for so long that it bec has become a part of their lives. And I feel very proud and flattered to be part of that. Oh, man. You, you've been a part of my life. So, like, seriously, Grimlock is, like, right there with Optimus, one of my favorite characters. I still have my G1 Grimlock. I have my back. Ready, fire, <laughs> aim! <laughs> oh, man, I, seriously, like, that's one thing I was going to ask you next. Um, I was really hoping, and I, I'm going to ask you, with last year's Transformers <laughs> Age of Extinction, Grimlock finally made his movie appearance. However, he didn't say anything. Um, no humans were hired in the making of that particular... <laughs> What do you think of the, like Grimlock? I was hoping that they would ask you just for at least me, Grimlock King, or something. Like that. Uh, it would have been uh, it would have been a dream. Uh, it wasn't part of, of that uh, film experience, and and uh, it, it it goes where it goes. Uh, I, I I thought the story was I I, I loved the film for the film, but ev everything has its own kind of world that it lives in and around and those are things that are outside of anyone's control except except the people who are um, creating and conceiving the film. They, it goes where it goes. Would you uh, let Optimus Prime ride on your back? <laughs> Would I? Like, yes, Grimlock, not you, of course. <laughs> uh, he would kill you if you tried to do that. No, I, I can carry people. 
Yeah. <laughs> that'd be, I would pay to see that. I would pay. <laughs> that'd be awesome. But yeah, like, uh, so besides from Grimlock, um, one of my favorite characters you did was Cornfed uh, from Duckman, which was a great show on USA Network. Um, yeah, it's good to have a mic available because I don't project a great deal when I do Cornfed. I just try to keep the duck out of trouble. I, I, that was such a great series, but it's very adult humor. Like, how does it feel doing uh, more adult uh, cartoons versus like the more you know kids cartoons? I, I think they're all translation problems, and you, you figure out the elevation of uh, a script that you're reading. You figure out, it, it's like playing in different bands, uh, and you just want to be adaptable to whatever, whatever ballpark you're playing in, and there are many different ballparks. It doesn't mean that you're any less entrusted with telling the truth than you are in any other format. The goal is to get the material, meet the people, meet the, meet the creative people, and try to make what you do consistent with what their conception is. And, uh, so it's all the same. For me, they're all exercises in telling the truth. If I'm not telling the truth, albeit through a character, uh, it's not fun for me. It's not, that, that's what interests me, and that's what wakes me up, and that's what makes me uh, an artist, and that's what makes me feel successful about a creative undertaking. Definitely. Um, before we uh, take uh, audience questions, so I'm going to go up to you. So if you guys have questions, just raise your hand, I'll go to you. One uh, question I was going to ask, um, with all the cool toys that have come out, for, like Grimlock and Odie and all the other characters you've done, even like Craven the Hunter and from Spider-Man, which I loved your Craven. And also, uh, before uh, Vincent Afiro, he was Kingpin in Spider-Man Web of Shadows, which I love. Um, yes, I was Wilson Fisk, the Kingpin. <laughs> he was such a good Kingpin. But um, do you own any action figures or collectibles of characters you voice? I, I have, I have some, but not all. Uh, as I as I stumble upon them, I, I have acquired some. Some have been uh, given to me. Sometimes uh, studio involved will will make it a gift. Uh, so yeah, I, I I treasure them all. Excellent. So if you guys have a question, raise your hand. I'll come up to you. And I'll answer is Gleek the Mouse from the Garfield Show. Hey, Greg, how's it going? It's good. How are you? I'm good. Um, I'm a huge Star Wars fan, and I really enjoy Star Wars Rebels on Disney XD. So if you got the call to do either a regular, recurring, or guest role on that show, would you be interested in taking that opportunity? Well, not only would I love that opportunity, but uh, I, I, in Clone Wars, I play the first super tactical droid general, Kalani. Yeah. So I was last seen floating through the galaxy, <laughs> awaiting orders, so anything is possible <laughs> in, a, in an infinite galaxy of possibilities. That's cool, man. Yeah, thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Jason Stefani. Um, let's see. How did you, if you haven't already covered this, get to be on Transformers or The Transformers, that was, as it was called? And who is your favorite Transformer, whether or not you voiced him? Uh, Wally Bird had cast me in one of the first things that, that I animated things that I had done, uh, a show called The Littles, and uh, it was a character very close to neutral for me. It was it was the dad in the show, uh, and he had seen me in the same show that Gordon Hunt saw me in on a different night. Or it may have even been the same night. I don't know, but he, Wally said, we're doing G.I. Joe and we're doing Transformers, two new shows, and although I might not have thought of you in this way before seeing you in, in the show was called Cloud Nine, and it was jumping in and out of character. He said, I want to consider you for roles in both Transformers and G.I. Joe. So I had a lot of material to look at and, and think about and consider, and uh, but I, I attribute that same on-stage experience to what led to being thought of in a much broader context than, than I originally had been. And uh, so it, it actually 
uh, catapulted me in Transformers and G.I. Joe consideration as well. Uh, I, think, I think for me, uh, although there's a million Transformer characters that are all interesting, I think when Skyfire first appeared, uh, just his moral dilemmas about how to proceed given his origin and given his rediscovery after being uh, trapped in the ice, uh, I think he's a fascinating, fascinating character. I love uh, Optimus and the whole Optimus line. I love uh, that Grimlock has the ego and the pride to think that he should be leader, but I made a joke about ready, fire, aim before. Uh, Optimus has the measured response to situations that deserve a measured response. So he's, he's like uh, extraordinarily cool, interesting, and uh, meant to be leader for me as an audience. For Grimlock, not so much. <laughs> me ready to step up. Hey, thanks, man. No uh, problem. Yeah. Any other uh, uh, audience questions? I'll come up to you. Don't be shy, you guys. Okay. Hey, great. Thanks for hey, hey. coming out to Sacramento. Uh, my question is: uh, You mentioned that you have some collectibles of. Um, of characters that you voiced, is there one that stands out to be your favorite or something that's really unusual? I don't know, like a life-size Grimlock that someone dropped in front of your yard or whatnot? Um, I, I have a masterpiece Grimlock that was a gift uh, in the UK uh, at an all Transformers convention called Auto Assembly. Yes, it's uh, awesome. And, and uh, it's, it's another as much as I love the big, big conventions in San Diego every year that I've been there, which is every year for the past many, uh, when it's an enormous pop culture roof that you're under, focus is going in a million directions. So everyone is overstimulated, everyone leaves exhausted, everyone has a phenomenal time. But sometimes when you have a more narrow cast event that's all Transformers, like BotCon, like Auto Assembly, and like uh, TFCon, and, and some others. It just, there's a different dynamic present, and, and uh, kind of an intimacy to the event, because everybody's kind of there for the same reason. But that was a gift to me, and that, that, that's a treasured gift, along with many others. But that's the answer to your question. Any other questions? Wait, I said I was gonna answer Squeak the Mouse, and I forgot. Oh yeah, there you go. Um, well, real quick, I was going to ask before you take any more. Um, the whole thing with Skyfire and the whole Jetfire thing with the toy, like, what's your thoughts on that with the whole, I know, Takara and Bandai, and then, like, but they had to make, call him Skyfire in the show, but then there's Jetfire and the toy, it's like, like, is this confusing for you as it is for us? It just, <laughs> you, you just go with the flow, and the same as, uh... Grimlock's new brain. When I first when I first got that sort of arc to the story, you're still entrusted with telling the truth, even if the storyline and the arcs and the and the reality of the show is being turned and twisted for for given periods of time. You're still entrusted with finding a way to make uh, to bring uh, truth uh, to whatever you're doing within that context, even if the context is changing. Uh, you're obligated to, to make it real for you as me as I'm seeing the world through any given character. Very awesome. Oh. I see your Emerald. So along that question that you just answered, I see sometimes script and what actually gets put on the screen. The words are just a little bit different. Obviously I imagine that's from the actors uh, freedom to be able to express how you want. How much do you think, percentage-wise, in all of your work, do you get to allow yourself to just come out and change what's literally written to what you feel this person would say or a character would say at that moment? Um, to speak to that point, you kind of have to gauge the water everywhere you are. And there are writers and directors who, of course, will want it as written, but very often, and this is their call, not so much yours, although you're, you're never going to lose friends 
by saying, of course we want to do it as written, but can we just uh, loosen it a little bit, just to, or, 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 or offer something up that maybe uh, feels a little easier to say, or, uh, well, plus I do a lot of work with Frank Welker, so there's there's a lot of playing. I mean, we're, we're getting paid to play, and and you don't, I don't usurp that privilege, I, I embrace that privilege, but uh, there are directors who will not, here's the best way to say it, there are directors who will not only allow, but encourage that play to be contagious, and that doesn't mean it has to be funny or stupid, it can be more epic, it can be more, whatever it is, it can be more if you allow uh, the ensemble to sort of talk and listen to each other beyond the page. Uh, it doesn't mean that'll get used, it just means uh, it, for some directors, writers, producers, creatives, that, that is encouraged. For others, it's not, because they, they've got a very firm uh, um, guidelines that they have to work within. So that's, that's that particular assignment. Each assignment is different. More uh, complicating than that is how much voice recording is done uh, with single characters now, particularly for interactive gaming. But uh, with very few exceptions, gaming is done just you and a director who's sort of painting the scenery around you but, but uh, you have to fit into what is a jigsaw puzzle for the editor because there's so many possibilities from any action or interaction. Um, animation, there's a better chance, although it gets more and more solo performance, but the Garfield Show has been, is, and presumably will always be done ensemble style. All of the old Hanna-Barbera shows used to be done with a, a sort of circular mic setup where everyone was in the room at the same time. Obviously, you know, the more the more people who are in the sandbox, the the more fun it is to play. If you're if you're sitting by yourself in a sandbox, you, you scoop sand and that's that. Um, so there there's there's too many answers to the question, but it's always uh, particular to that assignment. Uh, when we're allowed to have fun and loosen it up and make it as silly or epic or whatever it is that it's supposed to be, I feel like I, 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 I feel happier in that situation. I, I feel more creative. But, uh, you know, I was saying to Tanya at the table, um, this is a collaborative Art, and I have ultimate respect for the writer, uh, and I don't want to dishonor what he's put on the page, for the artist and what they've created uh, beautifully, and also for um, my contribution, which is to add a third dimension to something that exists in two dimensions before I get there, and three dimensions uh, when I leave there, presumably. And then there's post-production people that either make it sing and make it make it music or or it comes off disjointed but it's all the pieces of the puzzle and I'm I'm happy to be a piece of the puzzle but I'll never be the entire puzzle unless I'm a performance artist doing a, a one-person show even then I have to have lights I have to have music I have to have uh, direction and I have to have an audience very awesome any more questions from the audience? Okay. okay. Uh, I guess my question would be about the 80, 86, the animated movie. Yeah. And uh, just kind of maybe your thoughts or are there any fears with, you know, them, I guess, killing off Optimus and Megatron if, you know, if, yeah, Starscream, a lot of, you know, original G1 characters, um, if, you know, if Grim I think Grimlock was going to bite the bullet, or maybe actually <laughs> Leader, or, and not Rodimus, or, kind of your thoughts, I guess. I, I did uh, a convention not too terribly long ago with Flint Dill, who's the, the story editor, and uh, 
I think that was the first time that they, even they, the producers and uh, production team, had a sense of uh, what fandom would bear and wouldn't bear, and they were overwhelmed with fan involvement, and, you know, there were some twists and turns in the movie. I, I still will watch that feature any, at any opportunity, presumably uh, at a convention in a large audience with people throwing popcorn at each other. It, it, you know, it's, I think it's meant to be experienced sort of communally with, with a lot of people, although it's great to watch at home too. It is, it is a fantastic uh, character-driven uh, experience and I, I really, I really just love the interactions between characters. Uh, aside from the ones who die and then come back and then die and they, they, all, of, all of that. I, I, I just love it all. I love all of the twists and turns that it has and continues to weather. And wherever it goes, there's this huge contingent of audience that is, is willing to go with it up, up to a certain point. And then at that point, uh, it's, a, it's a fandom that makes its voice heard and heard loud. And thank you for that because uh, it's... it's it's helped shape my career and my life, and uh, honestly, if an image of Grimlock appears online, it's seconds before someone tags me to it. And that, I mean, that really, it just means everything to me. It's, it's just so awesome. Real, real quick on a side note, it was so awesome at BotCon 2011, seeing the movie with you and a bunch of the G1 voice actors. That, that made watching all those characters die a little less painful, so thank you, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, hi, uh, it's me again. Um, what was your favorite episode from G1? Maybe Grimlock's new brain. Uh, <laughs> And the fact that Grimlock gives it back to Computron because it's the right thing to do, and he he is not not as comfortable uh, with that elevated thought process as he is uh, with that elevated aggressive process. He rather much metal. <laughs> uh, on the subject of the Transformers animated movie. If the current live-action series of movies decide to use Unicron, who would you like to see, current voice acting-wise, take that role that could be as good or almost as good as Orson Welles? Wow. Uh, That's a big shoes to fill. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I don't... I think it would be someone who came out of the woodwork. I don't know that it would be anybody who was currently in the mix. It's a big responsibility and Wells just put his thumbprint on it. But I mean, it'll it'll be someone uh, if it ever becomes part of that Like, say James Earl Jones, for instance. That's a perfect choice. That's a great choice. Oh my god, that's a good one. Wow. Hey, come on, how can you go wrong with the voice of Darth Vader? No, yeah, great. That, like, that, <laughs> that's great. You worked on Clone Wars, you know Dave, probably just asked James Earl Jones. <laughs> you guys all know each other, you're a tiger group. <laughs> but, um, hey, Joey. Do you have a question for Greg? How long is your assembly? Wow! Subscribe to Joey on YouTube, he's awesome. So. <laughs> um, any other audience questions? Oh, cool, dude. This guy's awesome. Hey, how you doing? Hey, good. You're one of the few voice actors left that do a wider way of uh, voices. So do your character voices ever bleed into each other while you're working? I don't, I, I mean, I, I can say I hope not. Uh, maybe, there may be some who disagree, but I, I'm so grounded as, as an actor, as a teacher, as uh, just a lover of, of animation myself. Um, it's where, it's where I started the conversation, which is that they're all separate characters. And as long as they're separate characters, they shouldn't overlap. You're not doing anything again. You're doing everything for the first time it, through the eyes of a new character. And, um, you know, somebody says, how many voices do you do? And I, I don't think anyone who's versatile 
should be able to know how many voices they do. Because again, that has to do with a writer and a breakdown and suggestions that go into your head. And as you stir them around, hopefully something new comes out every time. Uh, maybe similar, but not the same. Awesome. Um, real quick, Greg. Um... I mean, if you start, if you start with Squeak the Mouse, and then you work your way to Eeyore, you've covered a pretty big palette. There's a lot of colors in that palette. Between here and here. That's what I was actually gonna ask. Um, is it easier to do the higher or lower pitch voices for you? Like, uh, like over time, like when you're in the high voices tend to be a little pinched on your throat. And low voices are just so relaxed. <laughs> but you're down in your shoes here, and you're up and top about here, here. <laughs> awesome. But you got everything in between to work with. I, I mean, I really do think of it as colors on a palette, and any time you mix two colors, you get a new color. Or three colors, or four colors. I like red, it's my favorite. <laughs> no, but, um, Thank you for sharing. <laughs> I just want everyone to know that red's my favorite color. <laughs> anyway. So continuing what you were saying then, how much preparation does each character get? If you're a recurring role, something you've done before and you have to come back to it, is there any preparation you have to do that to rechannel that character, or do they just come right out? Obviously, it looks pretty natural here, but when you're doing it for many hours a day, how much preparation is required before you're actually uh, recording? Uh, I was talking earlier today at the table about a book called Outliers by Mal Malcolm Gladwell, and uh, he maintains that anyone is 10,000 hours of hard, disciplined work away from mastery of anything. Well. I, um, uh, when you get to the 10,000 hour mark, you know, you can pick up your Stradivarius and play it. You can, you can uh, go out on stage and say... The, the amount of preparation time shortens with your understanding of your instrument and what it is you do and how it is that you do it. But uh, I, I, if you're just asking me, I need to remember the specifics of the character more than the specifics of the voice, and then the voice will follow. I just need to get in the zone, that, and and that takes anywhere from no time to uh, a lot of time. It just depends. There's no right answer to that question. And I mean, it's like saying uh, it doesn't matter what anybody's process is as long as the result is there at the time it's supposed to be there. Some people, you know, want to spend four hours in front of the mirror before they'll go outside and look like, quote unquote, themselves. Uh, and other people just shake their head and, and that's that. Um, things, things come, I, I, I'm so attached to the characters that I've been entrusted with doing that, that it tends to stay where it's supposed to be and is available at the time it's supposed to be available. Wow, that was a long answer to a short question. <laughs> I think they've all been long answers to short questions, so I'm sorry. I, or maybe I, I'm not sorry. <laughs> now that's a long answer to that. Better than a short long answer. <laughs> anyway, um, uh, I was going to also ask you for... Uh, you've been working with so many great voice actors. Like There's Peter Cullen, Frank Wilker, name a few, Chris Lana, who was... Uh, we miss dearly, and um, but I was gonna ask, like, for this newer generation of voice actors, which have have come, they're really talented people, and I'm sure you worked with them too. Is there anyone nowadays that you see, wow, this person's like really, like, he has a bright future, or she has a bright future? Like, who are your favorite current voice actors that you like working with, or just like you admire too? Um, uh, geez, uh, uh, everybody's got their own stuff. I don't want to. It's okay to play favorites. Find it to anybody. Jeez, <laughs> uh, there's there's a lot of good people. Too many, I, I know. Jason Marsden is awesome. Yes. Scott White is awesome. Uh, Chris Edgerly's great. Uh, I, it's a long list. James Arnold Taylor is ridiculous. Oh, yeah. uh, there, there's just a, a lot of, and and I think the one thing that that people who have, here's the deal. <clears throat> I think um, over time there are voices that are sort of perceived as kind of classic voices, the voices that you've always known and remembered, and contemporary voices that have a much tighter feel on, on just content. 
capturing the contemporary experience. I would like to be thought of, and I hope to be thought of, as, as both categories. Yes. And I think the people that really have longevity and, and serious, serious careers and staying power live in both categories. Uh, it's entirely possible, but sometimes people get designated to one category or the other, and that, like anything else, becomes limiting. Exactly. Any other audience questions? Okay. Great questions. I'm curious about something. Um, as a voice actor, how do you go about taking care of your voice? Because sometimes you range from outright, outrageously emotional characters to rather cool characters. You know, that puts a, quite a task, uh, quite a difficult tax on your voice. I try to be protective of my voice except when I'm working in studio. I believe that by holding back in uh, the actual recording process, you, you constrict things that you, as long as you're a hundred percent into what you're supposed to be into, even though it's taxing and there are sessions that you walk out of just convinced that you spit your tonsils out against the studio glass, uh, I can't hold back in performance or I won't hold back in performance, it's just my personal pride. But I'm, I'm, I guess it's like uh, primal animation therapy. I get it all out at work and, and I'm uh, pretty low key and low volume for the rest of my day and evening. So my protection is outside the studio more than inside the studio. I think when you're holding back in performance, it shows. And uh, if I'm teaching, I, I just say, go for it. And, and uh, if you're, it, because it's part of that entrusting with telling the truth. You, you can't pretend to be at a 10 if you're, if you're at a four. Uh, so when I'm, when I'm at it, I go for it. It's never not served me well. Uh, and then I, I, I'm protective in any other circumstance where it's possible to be protective. Excellent, anyone else? <laughs> Maybe go on the other side. It's worth I need the exercise. Can I just ask you to say me Grimlock King in the Grimlock voice? You can ask, but uh, he would have to answer. <laughs> me Grimlock King! Woo! Woo! Me no kisser! Me love cops war stories! Me munch metal! <laughs> Tell Grimlock about Petro Rabbits. <laughs> Anyone else? Um, cool. Yeah, I had a question regarding G.I. Joe's uh, spirit. I didn't, first of all, I didn't know that he did the voice and I did it. I thought he did a good job of, of it. Um, my, my question is, um, how much preparation did you go into preparing the voice for a spirit where there could be potential backlashes from like a Native American community and, and such and you know, how did you go about on doing uh, this voice? Again, uh, if you commit to the character, the voice will follow. Actually, Spirit and I share a lot of philosoph philosoph philosophy, philosophy. Uh, I think my philosophy is probably more similar to Spirit than any other character that I've done. It's like Orson on U.S. Acres, Orson Pig is a side of me, Corn Fed on Duckman is, is a side of me, uh, but spirits is possibility and impossibility are states of mind. In my mind, there is only the positive, possible. Oh, um, let's start over, shall we? Take two. Possibility and impossibility are states of mind. In my mind, there is only the possible, that which can be done. I tried to keep him more based on intention than anything uh, specific, and uh, it works. I, I, I don't think it's possible to be that high honor and high integrity a character and be offensive to anyone or anything. Uh, I think he's a beautiful soul, uh, and, and I loved being allowed to be him. Excellent. Anyone else? Can we wrap it up? 
sit back down now if I make sure. <laughs> Thank you for giving me exercise. So Greg, um, yeah, it's been a, uh, how, how's it feel to be back in Sacramento? I don't know that I've ever been here uh, in, in... Have you not? I've no. been here all the time. Well, welcome. I, it's our capital. Well, now you got me worried. If I've been here and don't remember, <laughs> that, that's a whole other thing. I walked to Old Sacramento this morning. I was up early and uh, out and walking around, and that is so cool. Uh, everything was closed, so it was kind of like stepping out of time and, and sort of being on my own and, and just in my own head and on the streets and stuff. And it's, it seems to be a fantastic city with a lot of history and a lot of uh, just cool areas. Just driving from there to here was, was very nice. But if I've been here, you're going to have to document it because I have no I have no waking memory of having been here. You definitely haven't been here because there's no cool areas. It's hot over ah. here. <laughs> it's like 90 something. And it's only uh, it's about to be June. And there you go. It, it's a lot hotter compared to like LA and everything. Uh, but yeah, like, um, do you have any upcoming projects or cons uh, want to promote? Uh, there will be dates, but they're all announced on my Facebook and on my sites, and uh, I'm, I'm available on Facebook, just slash my name, G-R-E-G-G-B-E-R-G-E-R. -E -E it's um, cool, cool that you have two G's, you're like that awesome, you're the you, double G. You'd have to talk to my mom, <laughs> Greg Allman is the only other one I can think of. Oh, that, well that's a good grade to be named after. Yeah, well I, actually she, uh, she was very proficient in Greg, G-R-E-G-G, -E -G -G, shorthand, and I think that had something to do with it. Very she decided awesome. she wanted a Greg, not a Gregory. <laughs> that's, that's cool. Um, but yeah, like, um, I just want to say thank you for coming to Sacramento, being and doing this panel. We really love having you. I hope you return, and hopefully you get some, meet some cool fans while you're here. Uh, your table is out in the front if you guys want to sign for, for Greg and take pictures. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, we're here till five, you guys. And um, yeah, I just want to say thank you for being part of this panel. Uh, I'm Sean Long. I uh, have a YouTube channel. I review a bunch of Grimlock toys too. I have. We need to make more Grimlock toys. I reviewed that um, Transformers, uh, Robots in the Skies. By the way, one last question: What do you think of Grimlock being green? <laughs> It goes where it goes. <laughs> it goes green, apparently. Uh, that's the color of money that Hasbro likes. <laughs> but um, yeah, oh yeah, Kari Payne and Voices Grimlock in the show. He does a pretty good job. He's a great as a, you know, a cyborg and Teen uh -huh. Titans and stuff. Uh, I was a little sad that they didn't ask you to come, but like, you know, no offense to Kari, but I'm like, yeah, it's. I, I, I prefer you being Grimlock always. Well, thank you. Even though David Cage did a good job and stuff. Uh, I, <laughs> Check out, I think there's a clip on YouTube with uh, you and David doing the back-to-back -back with Grimlock. Awesome. That was hilarious. That was fun. I know. If you guys ever go to any of the bot cons or uh, auto assemblies where you do the script readings, those are the best things ever. Scripts yeah. are so much fun. Uh, the, the scripts at conventions are usually uh, at least partially for laughs and big laughs if you're lucky. But yeah, thank you guys so much for being part of this panel, and yeah, make sure to check out Greg on Facebook and this website, and see you at Comic Con. I'll be there and stuff. It'll probably be so crazy. We'll be lucky if you cross paths. There's only 130,000 people between yeah. anyone and anyone else. Yeah, it'll be no biggie. We'll be hanging out and like drinking at the bars at the Hilton. <laughs> yeah, I'll buy you, buy this guy a drink anytime and stuff. So yeah. But uh, thank you, Greg, and uh, thank you guys so much. And yeah, I hope you enjoy the rest of the Sac Toy Expo. Thank you. My pleasure. Enjoy the expo. Cheers. Ah, oh, geez, the only way I can get back to the future with a bolt of lightning. Where am I gonna get that? I say to thee, you need lightning? Mjolnir can produce 1.21 gigawatts of power. What the hell is a gigawatt?